Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express controls and libraries. Deliver elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30 day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I'm talking with Sarah Squire. She's a senior technical architect at Ping Identity, and you're going to help me understand what's going on with Identity. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on, Scott. Yeah, this is great. I'm Finally, someone will explain to me what the heck's going on, because I thought we solved Identity on the web. I remember somewhere around 2005, 2006, uh, there was this announcement of like, you know, kind of quasi announcement, identity 2.0. And we were going to stop doing, you know, emails and passwords, and it was all being solved. So that's been 12 years. What's what, what was identity 2.0? So Identity 2.0 was an OSCON keynote uh, Mm -hmm. by Dick Hart, who uh, at the time worked for Skip Identity, which was his own startup, uh, who now works on Amazon Alexa. So if that tells you anything about the direction that Alexa is going. Mm -hmm. Um, So Identity 2.0 was actually part of the onboarding curriculum. That speech was part of my onboarding curriculum when I went into Identity um, about uh, six years ago. So um, it, it got me really passionate about the field. Um, it, it explained to me that there are a lot of problems to be solved and that people are solving them in creative ways. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I love about working in identity and that really inspires me about the field is that you can put in a small amount of work. This is like the one part of the technology stack where you can put in a small amount of work and get a huge output, both in terms of security and in terms of usability. And if you can make people happier and more secure at the same time, that buys you a lot in terms of value add for technology. Mm -hmm. Um, I was thinking about the differences, though, between identity for the technical person and identity for the non-technical person. And I was just thinking about this yesterday. I've had the same email address and I have owned my own domain now for, gosh, forever. I don't know, 17, 18, 19 years. Um, but my non-technical family members go through email addresses like <laughs> like crackers. Uh, and some of them have had four or five, six emails in the last, tw- and, and the reason that they abandon them is that they, they lose access. They forget the password. They lose interest. Uh, they change their email because maybe it wasn't professional and now they need to be professional. <laughs> so their identity doesn't change in, in the world, but it changes online a lot, which makes it really frustrating for them to move around the internet. Absolutely. Account recovery is a huge issue in identity, and there's some really interesting work going on there. So there are two initiatives um, that were both started by Facebook. Uh, One is um, key recovery through a third party. So you can um, leave a key to your Facebook account in your GitHub account. So that if you can get into one, you can get into the other. But it's very privacy preserving because GitHub doesn't actually know what that key is for. It's like giving a giving a physical key to a neighbor uh-huh. and saying, I might need this from you someday, but I'm not going to tell you what the key is for. I'm not going to tell you what safe deposit it is at which bank, right? Ooh. So that's so then, a great, great method of account recovery, right? Okay. So then like even someone who stumbled upon the key, like I found, we've all found keys on the sidewalk. Sure. Exactly. Ooh, I like that. There's always a movie where someone finds a key and it has a number on it, and we always assume it's for a <laughs> Yeah, another exciting uh, thing that's going on in account recovery is called social recovery. So a lot of businesses are looking at, um, I can delegate uh, five different trusted friends, and if three of them uh, come back to the service that I'm using and say, yes, this is Sarah, I have verified with her that she lost her key. Give me a code and I will give it to Sarah so that she can get back into her account. And if I can, if I, Sarah, can recover three of those codes, they will let me back in. Mm, that sounds like initially awesome. But if someone grouped, if someone kind of um, piled on you, like grouped up, you could have 
five, six mean people all collectively try to take over your account and they're all bad guys. Yeah. See, now you have to be nice to your friends. It's, it's good for the world. <laughs> I got an email literally yesterday saying from Facebook that uh, someone was trying to recover my account. And I wonder for people with well-known email addresses or with, you know, internet famous people, if that could become like a huge problem, like are famous people like Tom Cruise getting like password resets every 10 minutes? So famous people, um, at least for Google, probably for Facebook as well, have the opportunity to have an additional level of security. Mm. So they can use a, a second factor authentication device is what we call it in the industry. But it's a little uh, USB device. It goes on a keychain. You can plug it into your USB port and it has either a one time password or a private uh, key on it that can sign uh, cryptographic challenges uh, to prove that it's you. So that if you want to reset your password, it won't even send you an email. It won't even give you the opportunity unless you have that key with you. Interesting. Is that what's called a YubiKey? YubiKey is one provider of those. Yeah. yeah. I ordered one and it is literally arriving today. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I use YubiKey Nanos. Uh, I keep them on my earrings because they're little and gold. <laughs> and then when I go to conferences, people are, uh, know that I'm in identity immediately if they know what that is. So uh -huh. it's a good, uh, a good networking tool. And then I also keep one at home uh, in a safe because the problem is if you lose the one that you're carrying on your keychain or in your purse, um, if you keep it in your computer, if the computer gets stolen, right, you can't recover that account. You can't recover that key. So it's important to register two or even three keys and keep them in safe places or with friends. Interesting. Yeah, that was my next question. What if you lose it? Like I'm planning right. on putting mine on my keychain. But at the same time, we were talking about leaving a key somewhere at GitHub and no one knows what it is. I assume that if someone has a keychain with a YubiKey on it, then everyone's gonna be like, ooh, that's important. Like the existence of a YubiKey, even on your earrings could maybe have someone run up and grab them, rip them out of your ears. Like they are advertising that they are what they are. That's true. So is, yes. it, is the only answer just have as many as you as as you want? Like have backups? Should I buy another one? Yes, you should. You should have at least two, especially if you're going to be carrying one around. If you only need one occasionally, then just keep it at home in a safe. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be carrying one around, if it might get stolen or lost, absolutely keep a keep a backup somewhere safe. What is inside these these keys? Again, YubiKey is just one example, but this is a standard thing. And, and is it typing? Uh, is it like a, a keyboard? Is it pretending to be a keyboard and then typing in a, a one-time password? That's a great question. It has a lot of modes. So one is a, a private identity verification mode. That's the highest security. So um, that actually has a cryptographic key that is stored on the on the device itself um, that can sign challenges. Mm -hmm. um, it can work through a, a standard called Universal Second Factor or U2F that is part of the FIDO Alliance uh, standard suite. Mm -hmm. And then it can also just uh, do a, a time-based one-time password. Um, so basically what that means is that uh, when you log in, it will act as a keyboard for your computer. So it, it works exactly like if you have the apps on your phone mm -hmm. where you pull up a one-time password and then you enter it in. Oh. It's exactly the same technology, exactly the same standard, except that the YubiKey will create longer, more secure one-time passwords, and it will type them in for you. Right. I use... Th so again, we get to this identity theme yeah. of it's easier and it's more secure. Exactly. And I use things like Authy that give me that, and then they kind of collect all those things. But then it seems like as we build abstraction layers on top of abstraction layers, it feels a little bit like we uh, we expand but where like Authy has like 15, 20 accounts that, that I'm all managing. And then they give you a single password or I use one password or last pass, which puts hundreds of passwords. And then we give you a single password to manage it. So whenever I'm trying to sell two factor authentication to family members, as I'm sure you do at Thanksgiving dinner, you know, Hey everyone, <laughs> happy holidays. Make sure you get two factor auth. Uh, when you say, I see you've been listening to us <laughs> when you, when you do things like one password, they always go, wait a second. But then that means the bad guy would only need one password or my YubiKey or my Authy password. Is, is that just 
part of the ongoing tension of identity? It is, absolutely. We have we have a problem uh, with passwords in general. We're trying to get away from passwords. No one's been able to do it yet, though. They're a really secure, really easy, really uh, scalable and deployable method of authentication. So we're, we're stuck with passwords for, and we're going to be for a long time. There's no good way to keep track of them. Uh, but I would say, yes, uh, I use a password manager. I recommend that other people use password managers and have two-factor authentication on your password manager itself. Mm, okay. And these these standards, though, like U2, uh, U2F and then other standards that are kind of underneath it that are all supported by these different keys, like these NFC security keys, where you hold the key, tap it up against your phone, and then it does something. Are these all just different transport mechanisms to pass that one-time key in? Yeah, exactly. So uh, communicating, whether you're doing it over Bluetooth or NFC or USB, um, it's all using the same standards, the same technology. It's working the same way. That's just a difference in how it's communicated to the device. Okay. So whether it's a, a QR code or Bluetooth or whatever, it's just all transport mechanisms. Oh, okay. Um, I understand also, though, that uh, with regards to like NFC, that there was concerns that maybe the iPhone doesn't have the things that it needs to support it, you know, support uh, things like YubiKeys correctly. I wonder how much support we're getting from different phone manufacturers, from Apple, from Samsung, etc., to support these kinds of things versus their proprietary things like Face ID and Touch ID. Sure. Uh, Face ID and Touch ID are um, certainly a valid method of authentication. And if you are a developer who's looking for a quick and easy way to do two-factor authentication, uh, those APIs are open. They're very easy. It's just a couple of lines of code, and you can add them into your application and require a Touch ID or a Face ID, uh, either in lieu of or in addition to a password. So I highly recommend that. Mm -hmm. Um, But as far as NFC support... Um, that's always going to be a struggle, right? Um, even if Apple were to open it up, um, they could pull it out at any time. Mm-hmm. And so as a developer, it's very hard to be reliant on a closed system, a proprietary system like that, because you just don't have control over what's going to happen in the future. Mm-hmm. It's, it, do, are they on our side? Are they on the side of the consumer? Or are they on the side of standards? Uh, they do not normally come to standards agency meetings. Uh, they do not come to the IETF or the OpenID Foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, I can tell you that much. Uh, IETF, sorry, is the Internet Engineering Task Force. They do the uh, OAuth standard, mm-hmm. uh, which is a very common method of delegated, uh, uh, delegated, usually authentication, but technically authorization. Do um, these 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 identity um, organizations, these standard organizations, like the ones that you just described, um, are they able to really move the needle on the internet itself, or like do you ever find yourself coming up with a standard in a committee and then the standard never goes anywhere just because whatever um, business factors the internet didn't go for it or whatever? Like, are there standards that were amazing that would have solved all our problems, but they just never happened? I struggle with that question a lot. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, OAuth, OAuth 2.0, and OpenID Connect are certainly standards that ha- that the internet has picked up and taken uh, for their own. If uh, we probably, you and I, use OAuth and OpenID Connect every day. If you use login with Facebook, login with Google, um, anytime you do that, you're using OpenID Connect. So um, that has certainly had a lot of uptake. There are also a lot of great ideas in identity that have not gotten uptake. And I think it's because we're a very insular community. We're a very jargony community. And I would really like to fix that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm doing a talk at RSA this year called Identity in 10 Hundred Words. And the idea is borrowed from uh, Randall Monroe of XKCD. You know him, the webcomic? Of course. Um, So he wrote a book called Thing Explainer where he explains complicated objects like the Saturn V rocket using only the thousand most common words in the English language. So I decided that we need that for identity. We need to explain what authorization is, what authentication is in really basic, easy to understand terms. So that's the talk that I'm going to be giving. Um, That'll be on RSA TV on April 17th. Mm -hmm. Is that challenging though? Because I've, I've seen you write about this identity in 10 hundred words before. And I feel like if I were trying to explain this to non-technical, you know, family member, 
I might lose them at assertion and credentialing and system of record, even though those are English words that are simple, they sure sound complicated. Right. And that's the problem is that they do sound complicated. But an assertion is something that we've had for <laughs> as long as we've been humans, right? I assert that there are cookies in the cookie jar. And that may or may not be true. And you can check that assertion by opening up the cookie jar and saying, are there cookies in it, right? Mm, okay. So they might they might be initially challenging, but they are still basic words that have concepts that everyone understands. Right. Identity is not a hard field to learn. It's not a hard field to explain, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult to pick up if we're only using the industry specific jargon that all of us know that we can't communicate to everyday people, everyday developers. Right. I feel like sometimes I lose people at auth and auth. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. <laughs> Even industry professionals get, get lost with the difference between authentication and authorization. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember 12 years ago, 10 years ago, when OpenID was happening, I, I rushed to add meta keys to my, um, my blog, and then I started logging into Stack Overflow, uh, which was the first kind of major website that would let me log in by putting in my, uh, my, my uh, website. And then the browser did this dance where it would bounce over there and then look at my meta keys. And then there'd be, you know, a combination of client side and server side um, uh, handshakes for lack of a better word. But now when I go to things like Stack Overflow, I see Google, I see Facebook, I see LinkedIn, I see, I see basically everything except open ID and using Stack Overflow as an example, they've now buried open ID deep into uh, other options. Did OpenID die? Is it over? Is it just on? Is it just done? OpenID originally did not get a lot of uptake because most people don't run their own websites. Mm -hmm. They don't have their own domains. Mm -hmm. um, and then OpenID Connect came along and made it very easy for people to use OAuth for things like Google and Facebook and LinkedIn, like you mentioned, and have it be standard and interoperable and secure. So OpenID Connect definitely won out. Um, over the long term in terms of adoption. We're still trying to get it, though, in places like uh, banking. Mm -hmm. So there's an initiative in the EU toward open banking. If you use a financial aggregator like mint.com or personalcapital.com, mm -hmm. you actually enter all of your own bank credentials. You give them your password. And they scrape. They go off and then they log in for and you. And then they screen scrape, yes. And in order to screen scrape, they have to store your password in clear text, or at least encoded in a way that they can decode it. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. So it, it's not a it's not a salted hash password that they're storing. So this is a huge problem. Um, we and we're trying to use OAuth and OpenID Connect basically to force banks to have an API, have a protected API, so that I can say I'm going to uh, delegate access to my bank account to Mint.com so that they can access this API on my behalf. Mm, this is like when you log into something in Facebook or in Twitter and it says, uh, we're going to need to be able to log in when you're not around to do stuff. Is that okay? It's an extra bit of, of um, requirements that they request on your behalf, but they don't have your password. Exactly. So then you get that proactive consent screen that says this application will have access to your name, your address, your account balances, your activity. Uh, do you agree? Do you consent to give this organization access? Mm -hmm. um, but now, if you could maybe talk a little bit more about OpenID versus OpenID Connect, because I understand that they're both for authentication. And OpenID Connect, even though it has the same name, it's really OAuth underneath, which is an authorization protocol. Right. So when OAuth first came out, it was... Um, revolutionary, but in order to make it be interoperable between companies, you had to agree on, well, what do you call a name? Well, I call it name, you call it surname. What do you call an email? I call it address, you call it email, mm -hmm. right? So you had to figure out what everyone was calling different attributes. So OpenID Connect came along and added not only the authentication piece um, to OAuth, but also a basic profile piece to just say, here are the attributes that almost everyone needs, the pieces of information about the user that we all need. Let's just standardize what we're going to call these. Mm -hmm. And that's really what made adoption of OpenID Connect blow up. Mm. And if I log in then to Stack Overflow and I see Google or Facebook, will I ever again be able to have my own uh, you know, I don't know, security server to, to run it myself? Or should I just feel okay about these, these walled gardens and these giant companies managing my identity? 
because they are the best practice. So you mentioned standards that don't get wide adoption, but that are being um, created. One of those standards in the Internet Engineering Task Force is uh, what we call dynamic registration uh, in the OAuth working group. So dynamic registration is the concept that you have a signed statement uh, that lives somewhere on your website that mm -hmm. says, Here's my, here's all of my OAuth endpoints. Here's my public key. Here's my name. Here's my domain. Here's all the domains that I use. And then anyone can come to your um, application and either use it to log in or log into it. Hmm. I'm trying to. So that there's no pre registration required. So instead of having a login with Google, login with Facebook, login with LinkedIn, you can say login with your domain. And you can type in hanselminutes.com and it says, okay, let me look up where your software statement is. Mm -hmm. And then I can register you without any humans having to do anything as an OAuth service provider. And then you can log in with your domain. So that seems to bring us back to the beginning in 2006 when I would go and uh, and and say my open ID. Like if you look in the meta tags of my blog, I still have these things. Um, actually, I'll do it right now. View page source, and there it is. There's like meta tag open ID. Uh, it says go over here, and then I think I had one of the the open ID providers at the time do that. Are are we just returning to that idea? Yes, it's a different way of doing that same mm -hmm. thing. There's also some really interesting work going on um, in the blockchain space. Mm -hmm. So um, companies called Evernim and a nonprofit called Sovereign are working on creating um, a public directory of people of identifiers for people or organizations or businesses, and then an associated public key and identity document. Mm. So that's some really interesting work that's going on that could also enable that sort of um, decentralized open way of authentication through whatever mechanism you mm -hmm. choose. So then there would be a publicly available ledger that was like a publicly available um, immutable yellow pages or white pages out there for people to look up other people. Yes, exactly. Interesting. But the, I, I don't know who Evernim is, but it sounds like, as with all things, if I went to their website, it would probably say products. And how do we balance trying to build companies around these things versus trying to build uh, standards that will live beyond Evernim.com going out of business? So the Sovereign Foundation is part of uh, this strategy. Mm -hmm. So Evernim would be one identity provider in the broader um, Sovereign ecosystem. So mm -hmm. the idea is to have an ecosystem that anyone can join, anyone can create a node. Um, it is a permissioned ledger. So um, you can kick people off if they're acting maliciously, if they are attacking other people. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that anyone should be able to join. Anyone should be able to, to have a node, to act as an identity provider, and that um, it should be open and, and distributed. Mm. So not reliant on any one company or person. I like that. I do not want to be reliant on anyone. As much as I like logging in with my <laughs> Google account, I don't want to be reliant on anyone. So let's get to practical. What can we do when we're done with this podcast type stuff? There's Authy and there's LastPass and there's one password and there's coming standards and there's YubiKeys. Uh, right now I go to Thanksgiving dinner and I tell everyone to think about using something like Authy and turning on two-factor auth, at least on Gmail and Facebook and if they can on their bank. But YubiKeys, and I use YubiKey in the generic term like Kleenex, not trying to sell their stuff. But right. um, it still feels a little techy. Like I'm not sure how I could sell my dad a YubiKey or should, do you think I should? Um, I think you should. I think mm. that it's getting really easy to crack passwords. Mm -hmm. um, and part of that is due to bad password policies, which we should also talk about. Um, but uh, YubiKey, it, it's not a hard concept, right? You can keep it on a keychain, you plug it into a USB drive when the computer tells you to. It is mm -hmm. something that everyday people can do to increase their security. Um, and even if they are not people who would be specifically targeted, even if they're not celebrities, even if they don't have a lot of assets to steal, there are people doing broad uh, attacks of um, just swaths, 
swaths of people at different services and hoping that they come up with something useful. And, and having your identity stolen, as everyone knows, is just a huge amount of work to recover from. So if, if buying a YubiKey and tapping it every time you log in is a solution to that, that's, it's like flossing your teeth, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, so- it's a pain, but, but you do it to avoid the, the worst pain down the road. Right. The way I got my kids to floss their teeth was I said, if you're not flossing, you might as well just not even bother brushing. Like it's not even worth it. So <laughs> to, to apply that to, uh, you know, if you're not using two-factor auth, you might as well just make your password password because ultimately you will be owned. You're not wrong. <laughs> so do you recommend past phrases or do you recommend password managers to, to non-technical parent? I recommend password managers for sure. I think they're uh, way better. Past phrases are also good. So past phrases are um, where you have um, a a sentence or a line or um, a series of regular English words that you can easily memorize and type in. So Mm -hmm. what that makes for is a really long password that's very easy to remember, which is exactly what we want in terms of entropy. Mm -hmm. I'm looking, using again, just YubiKey as an example. I'm sure you can suggest some other ones. If I go up there and I click store, I'm technical. I have a podcast about technical stuff, and I'm looking at eight different YubiKeys, and I don't know which one to pick. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, this one's cheap, and this one stays in the port. But then Sarah said, don't keep it in the port. Put it on an earring. This one's tiny. I have no idea how anyone would expect this to become a, a, uh, a widespread, everyone has one consumer thing if, uh, if they don't solve that problem. You know, there are 20 different kinds of floss. They all work. Hmm, that's true. Exactly the same, right? That's true. Touche. Uh, I do think it's, it's a problem that YubiKey, that YubiCo, which is the name of the company that produces YubiKeys, uh, is the primary provider currently. They are the only mm-hmm. one who who is really doing this at scale. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, you know, if we start to rely on them and mm-hmm. something happens, if they decide to go proprietary, if part of their supply chain gets wonky, right, and they can't produce as fast as they could before, um, we're all in trouble. Interesting. So let me ask you this, though. If they if that happens, theoretically, or if we start looking at whoever's, you know, if, if I say I want one of these keys from anyone who is not YubiKey, Am I going to be looking at dodgy overseas tech companies that I've never heard of? And might they be compromised? Yes, absolutely. You might be looking at dodgy companies. They might be compromised. Um, There is a a standards organization called the FIDO Alliance that Mm -hmm. certifies companies so that you know whether their uh, authentication devices are actually compliant with 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 the security standard or not. So if you see U2F, the letter U, the number two, the letter F, U2F certified on a device, mm-hmm. that means that it is compliant uh, with the security standard and you can trust it. I see. So just like I can buy a, uh, a power adapter and it says UL certified and people have over the years learned about that, we'll start learning that FIDO certified means something. Exactly. Okay. Um, right before we started recording, uh, as you'll recall, we were, we were talking about what we were going to talk about on this show. I got a phone call and it said unknown caller, but it said San Diego. And I don't, I don't know anyone from San Diego. So you were very kind and you said, okay, I took a moment and I took the call and it was someone saying that they wanted to give me money. It was my healthcare provider that said that we've cut a check for you. And without realizing that I was also on the phone with a identity expert yourself, I said, (laughs) how do I know that you are who you say you are? And they said that they were going to email me. Did I do the right thing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Phone phishing is very common. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of companies still use what we call knowledge-based authentication, which is secret questions or questions over the phone about your account, about personal information, about places you might have lived. A lot of authentication, including credit applications, is still done in that manner. Um, I was part of the team that rewrote the NIST digital identity guidelines, and Mm -hmm. we actually outlawed that for federal agencies. So Mm -hmm. at least as far as the American government is concerned, they are not allowed to use knowledge-based authentication, Mm -hmm. but banks still do it people who can open up lines of credit, people who can issue mortgages, they still use knowledge-based authentication. So giving out personal information about yourself Mm -hmm. is still dangerous. 
it's we would love to get to a place where that's not true because personal information is very easy to find on the internet, but hmm. we're not there yet. They have not yet emailed me, which creeps me out. Well, maybe it was an attacker. See, and this is the other thing. You know, when you get a mortgage in the U.S., they'll say, uh, okay, we're going to do some authentication of the phone. And then they start asking you questions about like, 30 years ago, you used to live on what street? And then, they, you know, how do you know this? This is yeah. not okay. This is not a way of proving it's me. You know more about me than I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's even worse when you don't know, like when you get right. the security questions, it's like, you know, what's your favorite food? I'm like, I don't know what my favorite food is at the time I took this test before. Yeah. So I was working with the University of Washington when they replaced their knowledge-based authentication system, and they had data going back 10 years showing that um, 60% of users get their secret questions wrong on the first try. Really? So it's not just bad security. It's really bad usability. We do not even know ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sarah Squire, for talking to me about identity today. It was wonderful talking to you, Scott. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.